before we begin this episode, we would like to say that in the spirit of reconciliation, that we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, sea and community. We pay our respects to the elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Welcome back to another episode of Spaghettification on the Astropunk. And I'm Sophie. Today we have with us Lisa Harvey Smith. Hi, everyone. Hey. Hello. So, Lisa, or Professor Lisa Harvey Smith, is an award winning astrophysicist and author with talent for making the universe accessible to all. She has published more than 50 research papers in astrophysics and played a key role in the development of the Square Kilometre Array, array. Uh, and, Austra- and, and Australian SKA Pathfinder Telescope. She is a member of the advisory group to the Australian Space Agency, the Questacon Board. I love Questacon. A professor of practice at the University of New South Wales and is the Australian Women in STEM Ambassador. Welcome, hey. Lisa. Thank you. That's me. I like to be busy. I get to ask the first question now. Hi, Lisa. Can you tell us where your love of astronomy came from and how did you get into astrophysics as a career? Yeah, well, I'm definitely not one of these astronomers who mm. can't tell the Southern Cross from the <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but I, yeah, I did actually, I was an amateur astronomer way before I was a professional. And um, yeah, I, I definitely fell in love with the stars as a kid pretty cool isn't it like looking up at the stars and, and realizing wow we're really not as important as we think we are <laughs> I think that's that's a really healthy thing and I actually think you know people who are struggling with potentially parts of their lives that are difficult and challenging like could really learn a lot from astronomy because it's it's got that wonderful sort of es- escapism to it but it's also kind of mind-blowing and you know it's got a lot of fun explosion elements as well if you're that way inclined so <laughs> yeah I guess I was a kid looking at the stars and just um fell in love with it really um looking with my dad when I was about 12 but before that I think um I was saying the other day to someone I remembered a mobile planetarium came to our school when I was I don't know 10 or 9 or something those things make such a difference I remember Mm -hmm. when I was doing my PhD Mm -hmm. and um and we actually had an inflatable planetarium and we Mm -hmm. used to take that round to local schools in the Manchester area where I was doing my PhD at Jodrell Bank Observatory in the UK. Oh my God, it was so much fun and kids like, you know, it's so excited to go inside this planetarium and then they get inside and they're like screaming and shouting and suddenly you turn the lights down and you you turn the, the stars up and they just go, yeah. whoa, you know, yeah. and, and everyone just shuts up just for a minute. <laughs> it's terrific. So parents, if you want to get yeah. your kids to shut up, maybe try a bit of a strong. Come to science works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Definitely. I had a similar experience. I grew up in Newcastle in New South Wales, uh, not Newcastle in England. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and we did a school trip to Dubbo and there was a planetarium oh, yeah. there and yeah. um, it was awesome. You know, like the other kids were excited but not super excited, but I was just like, oh, wow. <laughs> Life changing, isn't it? Yeah. I think it sort of gives you a mind shift, you know, from the everyday. You think your your home or your like local area is the only thing that exists, and then I don't know. When I never travelled as a kid, but um, you know, imagine if if you travel the world or something as a child, it would it would just open up that possibility of new languages and new people. And mm-hmm. yeah, it was the same with the stars. I just thought, wow, this is unbelievable, so exciting. And I I just read every single book going. Like I've read hundreds of books I think by mostly by Patrick Moore who's this old eccentric British guy um who used to present um a show on the BBC called The Sky at Night completely weird guy but um (laughs) actually a role model for me because he was the only person on TV doing astronomy at the time and it was yeah it was really exciting kind of be cool to to walk in the footsteps of people like that and just share astronomy with with everyone else like you you do as well yeah so I I got into it. I remember doing it as a kid. I don't didn't ever have the planetarium come to the school, um, but I'd forgotten all about it when I became a teenager um, and I got into Dungeons and Dragons and all that sort of fun stuff. <laughs> and um, then I refound it because of my son, who at the time was eight and fell in love with astronomy. And we joined the ASV and took him along. He did juniors for a while and he now does stuff with Jeff Cook and um, Dr. Sarah Webb at, at Swinburne mm-hmm. Uni. He's only 16, but since he's been about 11, he's been helping them when they do their fast radio bursts um, stuff. He, he loves it. And we go every month up to the ASV's Dark Sky site. In fact, we're there just the weekend with my son and my daughter. Uh, and we're going again this weekend because you're right, it's just that getting away from everything and you can leave your troubles behind and you sit out under the stars and you see everything up there and you just go, I've got nothing to worry about. There's so much more out there. Um, yeah. There's just 
yeah, just seeing those objects with your own eyes as well and realising how far away they actually are mm-hmm. and that you can see that through a telescope and you're on Earth and it kind of just humbles you. It does. It's, it's just profoundly humbling, isn't it? Yes. Mm. Like yeah, scary. Very much. Very remember being a kid and um once I yeah I also read all the books in the school library (laughs) about astronomy and the public library and um yeah once you learn just how far away they are like I was almost scared to look up for a couple of months where I was just like it's too far away to even contemplate um but I got over that uh after a little bit and um yeah, I, I get to do that now to other people in the planetarium. <laughs> is that what they call cosmic vertigo, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Is that like, yeah, you feel it was also, also a name of a podcast, but yeah. <laughs> it's like that <laughs> feeling that like, yeah, yeah that, that it's it's almost too much to think yes. about. And yeah. I, I sometimes think that, that scares people, but mm-hmm. I try not to think about it always yes. as well, you know, because you, you can't, yeah. you can't yeah. actually <laughs> imagine those distances and you can't yeah. imagine the, the depths of space. So just... Um, Use it as almost a meditation. It's kind of cool. I just love the fact that I can look through a telescope and see a galaxy that's 60, 70, 80 million light years away. Yeah. And there it is. It's just in front and you can see the shape of it. The other one I love, is I love the fact that I can take a photo of it. I can take a photo of that galaxy through a telescope with with a, with a, with a camera and just go, yeah. there is another galaxy with a whole lot of, you know, millions of other stars and millions of other planets out there. Uh, it's just, yeah. I don't know. It's it's so much fun. I don't think I ever get bored of it. Beats these Marvel movies, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Far more entertaining. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> Did we actually finish the second part of that question? How you got into the field of astrophysics? Ah. No, I don't think I said that part. Well, you know, small details. You know. Um, look, I, I after I became such a sort of nerdy amateur, you know, super geek um really really into astronomy as a young person i joined my local astronomical society as a good thing to do (laughs) um and i joined yeah it was called braintree astronomical society in the uk Mm -hmm. um and it was just such a great place because not only did i get to meet people who knew more than me but i got to meet professional scientists as well and i'd never have another outlet to actually meet anyone who did science as a job Mm -hmm. and that and then ask them questions and understand how you get to be a scientist. So I've kind of figured out that I needed to do exams and go to uni and stuff. Um, did all that. Those kind of details, you know, it's a lot of long, hard slog, but it's about seven years at uni uh, doing an undergrad d- degree in astrophysics and a PhD in a, a radio astronomy, which is like the big dish one. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, did that. That was amazing. The PhD was brilliant. The undergrad was a bit boring, to be honest. <laughs> it was like a long slog. Lots of maths, lots of physics, nothing yeah. else. Super hard. But yeah, the PhD was brilliant because it was suddenly freedom from learning and freedom to explore and actually implement what I'd learned in the real world or the real universe, so to speak. So I was actually studying stars that were being formed in our galaxy, massive stars, so ones that have a huge mass, more than about 10 times um, the mass of our sun. And those stars are really unusual and, and different because they they burn faster, they burn hotter than our sun. They create heavy elements uh, like metals and carbon and oxygen in their cores. And they end their lives in super, supernovae, so explode. And, um, yeah, they're very, very interesting and quite mysterious. So we're trying to figure out lots of things about those using radio waves. So that was a it was a great journey. Yeah, a bit of a slog up to the end of the degree, but PhD kind of freed me to really spread my wings as a scientist. And then I spent a couple of years in the Netherlands um, studying there, doing astrophysics with a major radio telescope network in Europe. And then I moved to Australia um, probably 16 years ago now, and the rest is history. You've, you've, you've answered some of our questions. <laughs> My next one was actually going to be about your time at Max Planck Institute. But you've oh, uh, yeah. Well, no, 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 Max Planck was in Germany, so that was, a, that was just a summer studentship. So I did that between my degree and my first job in, in Holland. So, like, I, I knew that it would be really competitive to do science because there aren't many jobs and there are lots of people who want to do it. So yeah. I thought what can differentiate me from the other people with the same degree because lots of people graduate every year. Um, so when I was at uni, I begged my lecturers to get me a summer studentship because I, was, I saw them advertised um, and I went to university in Newcastle in the UK and there was a poster up and it said ATNF summer studentship. Like, what does that mean? 
and I read the small print and it was the Australia Telescope National Facility, which I later worked for for 10 years <laughs> in Sydney, Australia. And um, it said we pay your um, stipend like for food and accommodation, but you have to pay your own airfare. I couldn't oh, afford wow. that. Yeah, yeah. So I couldn't do that, unfortunately. So I, I was begging my lecturers to get me something else and they got me something in Germany. Mm. And I was very lucky to go for six weeks or maybe eight weeks. I can't remember now to the Max Planck Institute in Germany where um, they run the huge 100-metre radio telescope in Bonn. Um, and that was really, really cool. It was so great to be working with real scientists, working in a foreign language. Like, I didn't speak German. These people speak English, thankfully. <laughs> and, and just working with people from all over the world on real problems. It was really exciting to, to do that. That was, yeah, I was very lucky. Yeah. So I thought I have a question. I know a bit about a very long baseline infrometry, but could you explain oh, yeah. it a little bit um, and what you yeah. were sort of studying with it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So so very long baseline in interferometry is a very long way of saying <laughs> using lots of telescopes together as a team to actually look at one thing. So say you've got a radio telescope and it's just one telescope and you look up at a galaxy, all you see is a blob. It's like a smear, blurred smear or a dot. <laughs> So if you use lots of different telescopes spread out over a large area, then you can actually get a zoomed in image. So it's like having eyes across the skies, all looking at one thing. You get high resolution images, the bigger your telescope. So we use multiple telescopes and radio astronomy spread out to form this kind of mathematical image of the radio sky that's got more detail. So it's like a zoom lens for radio telescopes. And it's, it's a fantastic technique. And it was used to make that famous image of the black hole and and it's it's a it's a great technique so i've been using that my whole career mm -hmm. it's it's hard because you've got to do yeah. a lot of maths but the computer yeah. kind of you program a computer and then it does it for you and what's the longest baseline you ever used but what i really oh, yeah. mean is like yeah. what is the most distant telescopes you've used at i'm working at um something called the joint institute for vlbi in europe drive which is in the netherlands um mm -hmm. and we ran a radio telescope network it didn't just encompass europe and mm -hmm right over to Russia and um, down to, it went all the way down to South Africa and West, it went all the way to Arecibo, which was where the wow. world's biggest <laughs> telescope was at the time. And now it's like, now it's died. <laughs> yes. Rest in peace, Arecibo. Um, I've still got a coffee mug from Arecibo downstairs. Uh. That last longer than the telescope. Sad, sad, sad. But anyway, that's a long, that's a long baseline. Yeah. That's basically the size yeah. of the earth. It, it's, it was probably over, over 10,000 kilometers. Um, it's amazing. Uh, you, you can kind of use the Earth's rotation to switch them on as they see the same as object as, as the <laughs> sun or whatever you're looking at rises over the over the different yeah. part of the Earth. It's pretty. So, it's it's a pretty rad kind of technique to to use. It's, it's very so useful. What's the percentage increasing in quality improvement from using one to two to like like how much better oh, you, is it? like thousands of times better in millions yeah. of times you know it really is it's it's um all down to say you had a 100 meter dish like the pretty much the biggest one in the world and then you have a 100 kilometer dish yeah <laughs> you know, like yeah. times by 10 and 10 and 10 factors of 10 you've got 10,000 kilometers infinitely um, better then it, yeah. it's hugely better so you can get resolution like you know grain of sand in New York kind of these comparisons wow. they always okay. but like you know it's like seeing a coin across the US or across Australia or something like that That's in, or a that grain of sand Perth to Sydney that kind of thing um but yeah it's pretty it's pretty amazing yeah yeah I think my, that is impressive I think, I think my favorite story that I heard from Seth Shabala at UTAS um yeah. about VLBI because they have a I think Tasmania the dish that they have there is part of the network but yeah. um looking at the drifting of the continents because the yeah. um the baseline is changing as Tasmania moves away and like earthquakes will also affect it as well. Um, That's and it's... right. I remember some colleagues were looking at a pulsar, um, a rotating star with a, mm -hmm. with a network of telescopes when the um, Boxing Day tsunami happens. Yeah. Um, back in, was it 2001 or something? It was a long time ago anyway. And um, yeah, they actually noticed the wobble of wobble of the pulsar, which was actually the Earth wobbling due to that huge <laughs> earthquake. So it's incredible. Wow. Yeah, the the you can measure the Earth changing, and they try yeah. and include that in the models. But when it does something unexpected, it kind of drops <laughs> all to one side. It's like remember in Star um, Star Trek 
the old versions years ago and they used to hold the desk and they were doing all this <laughs> yeah. one side to the other. Well, that's what that's we do amazing sometimes. Amazing though. <laughs> Being able to tell that, pick up that that wobble was from us, not from. That's incredible. Yeah. That's yeah. incredible. Absolutely incredible. We had a bit about how you looked at cosmic magnetic fields and I sort mm. of wondered if you'd um, talk to us a little bit about that because I think one of your books goes into um, this a little bit as well. Yeah, I, I think remember. when galaxies <laughs> collide, my first book yes. goes into yeah. that. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. yeah, so I've, I've spent a lot of my career mm -hmm. studying um, magnetic fields in space and there's quite a few ways to study them actually, but it's, it's kind of weird because they're, they're actually invisible, of course, magnetic fields, <laughs> but they, like gravity, they... they we can see them by their effect on other things. Mm -hmm. So you get particular types of radiation that happen when particles in space get moved by magnetic fields. And so if there's, say, let's say there's a magnetic field in a galaxy and it's just kind of like a field, you know, like lines, imaginary lines of force, um, and you've got a bunch of cosmic rays like electrons or protons, bits of atoms that are broken up and they're electrically charged, positive or negatively charged, if you get um, a magnetic field or a magnet, something like that, and then you have something that's positive or negative, it will be pulled or pushed by the magnetic field. So it spirals around the field lines. And when that happens, it releases radiation, a particular type of polarisation. And you know polarisation from like sunglasses, obviously you wear yeah. those if you're out by the water, if you're in a boat or fishing or whatever it is. And um, polarization is just the orientation of light, whether it's that way, that way, that way, which direction it's basically wib wibbling up and down because um, that's the technical term. Um, <laughs> so, so we measure yeah. this clever radiation that comes from these spiraling broken atoms in space and they wibble in a particular direction. They'll all be lined up with the magnetic fields. Um, so we can actually see an invisible magnetic field billions of kilometres away just from the polarisation of light coming to us. That's, yeah. um, and we measure that in the radio telescopes or in other uh, other instruments. Yeah, so it's 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 sort of detective work, um, a yeah. lot of this research. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's clever. It's techniques that have been built up over the generations of scientists. Um, yeah. A lot of things we don't invent ourselves, we take from the previous generation and we modify them to the new technologies that we have today. So that's what yeah. we, we really do. I guess it's sort of like if you had a bar magnet and you were trying to investigate the magnetic field of it without knowing, like, from you know school or something, yeah. what the magnetic field lines are, you'd have to figure out how to do that using sort of... Well, you get paper and you... <laughs> Sprinkle yeah, eyes exactly. Eyes yeah. Eyes. You the, yeah. You know, so or you get a compass. <laughs> I, I do hearing. It's one of my hobbies. And, you know, we still use compasses like in the old days. And, you know, the, the magnetic field lines of the earth are, of course, everywhere, everywhere you go on earth. And um, it's very clever that they can help us orient ourselves. And actually there's quite a lot of evidence that um, these have been used for thousands of years, possibly by um, indigenous people in Western Australia, there's magnets and, and evidence of magnetic mountains and things like that. It's, it's a very old art form. Yeah, I've been known about for a long time. I use one of those lovely compasses, orienteering compasses, to polar align my telescope whenever I take it. There you go. Light. Because yeah. it's, it's so hard. If you want to, you want to set up during a day, and you can't, you can go I, roughly. It's in that direction, but by using a, a an orienteering compass, a good quality compass. I can actually get it in almost spot on during the day so that as soon as it does get dark, you know you're in the right spot. You're facing, you can get the southern, you know, the um, whatever we're with, uh, pol no, we don't have Polaris, we have the southern, south celestial pole. That's it. Oh, it's easy when you when I was a kid because I lived in England. <laughs> yeah, and you, you just look at the really bright <laughs> star that's hang on. Yeah, yeah, like, thanks very much. Yeah, because the poles yeah. move over time. You just imagine it's swinging around the sky. Yeah. Some, some poor person in the future won't have that luxury. Yeah, yeah I think, well, like, I, think um, I have to align to 168 degrees, so about 11 to 12 off of south to get it. Yeah. Yeah, because the compass won't tell you the right direction either, will it? Yeah, because the yeah. Kind of, geomagnetic pole moves mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I did talk to my my archaeoastronomy students last week. Got a bit about yeah the magnetic pole changing 
Um, and I was like, you know, we can predict how the the celestial poles are changing because of precession. Um, but the magnetic pole, we actually don't know like where that was 10,000 years in the past because mm. the earth is so complicated <laughs> and they just had very sad faces. <laughs> like yeah. it's be harder than we thought. <laughs> you, can measure, you can measure magnetic alignment in the rocks of yes. solidifying yeah. the time and iron rocks, yeah. but we don't know where they were because everything's yeah. moved yeah. up, down, yeah. Yeah. back, yeah. forward. Like, <laughs> You know, Tasmania used to be in northern, yeah. you know, it's just everything's moving and yeah. it's hard. People need so to I stop picking know. rocks up it's and moving them then. Just throwing <laughs> rocks. Well, the I, mean, <laughs> I think we're on to the next one. But Yeah, um, I was going to say, do you want to take the next one since I sort of yeah, intercepted you, your last you question? Intercepted my last one. And it's, it's one I'm actually really interested in yeah. because um, I'm curious to know a little bit more about this. So can you tell us what it was like to be the project scientist for the Australian Square Kilometre Array? Yeah, it was it was it was quite a hard job actually. So the Australian Square Kilometre Array, Pathfinder or ASCAP, and also the Square Kilometre Array. So as pro project scientists for both um, at CSIRO. <laughs> um, yeah, just to clarify, they did both jobs at different times. But, yeah, the, the, the Pathfinder Telescope, ASCAP, is this amazing 36-dish contraption in WA on Wadjuri country, and it's a it's a beautiful thing because it's uh, these sort of 12-metre dishes. They're about like a two-storey building high. They're very big, um, but small for, a, you know, compared to the giant radio telescopes. Um, but they all work as a team, like we talked about earlier, as a, an array. So they're a little army and they all look in the same direction and help us understand um, what's going on. Now, it's it's a completely new technology used on this telescope and the, the engineers that came up with it have done an amazing job because it's such a it's got such a wide field of view. In other words, you can see a lot of the sky all at once. And that enables us to do incredible surveys of the whole sky instead of just looking at one tiny, you know, bit in mm. front of the telescope <laughs> like that through a toilet roll tube, you know. <laughs> so, um, yep. so basically it's new technology. It was really hard because I was working with the engineering project management teams and then the construction teams and then the commissioning teams as it was being built. So when I started the job, it was just writing on a piece of paper. It was just theory, just like a set of drawings, you know, that an architect does before they build a house. And then that's I went me. through the that's whole. <laughs> that's what I do for a day job. There you go. I didn't even know that, and I've, I've put a relevant example. There, so. Sorry, I Thank get excited you. when people know what architects do. So. Yeah, so it was, yeah, it was an architectural job, and then and then there was so much involved, um, you know, planning, getting the scientists uh, excited about using it and planning what they wanted to do with it, working with the commissioning team, working with the the, the construction team, the people testing the engineers, people actually building the thing, uh, and it was just so complex. It was a really interesting thing, but the the coolest thing, if you want to think of like what was cool for me. Um, two things one was getting to go to amazing remote sites um, I had to do a four-wheel drive exam and like cool things like <laughs> driving in random bits of dust in WA which was really yeah. cool um, I, got, I got to visit the site you know dozens and dozens of times very remote spot um, a beautiful beautiful area and I got to know some amazing people in nearby communities as well and um, actually help and watch and um uh, you know be involved with a, a project that that was really from the ground up building into some major international globally significant scientific infrastructure and that was yeah. very very cool but the coolest part was when the telescope was finished mm -hmm. and we'd done loads of commissioning and testing and I did the you know one of the first observations the first observation of a distant galaxy actually with the telescope and looked at this black hole that was sucking gas in a spiral <laughs> a spiral into it and uh, doing an estimate of the mass of the black hole uh, which was like two billion light years away um, using like clever physics -y things um, from the gas like the gas was screaming yeah. as it went around the the black hole and we measured the difference of speed in the gas from this side and that side to figure out like how heavy the black hole was and writing a paper on that and publishing it was one of the first scientific uh, publications from the telescope so going from that from literally no telescope existing <laughs> to some of the first scientific research with the telescope that was yeah. 
Superb. Uh, ASCAP, the Pathfinder. Yeah. Um, he's at the MRO, the Murchison Radio Observatory. Is that right? That's right. Yep. Yes. Um, and so you mentioned that it was very remote, but just like just how remote is the site? And why yeah, would we, so, we choose to put something in such a remote site? <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's a fantastic site. Um, firstly, getting there from where I worked in Sydney at the time. Um, so you go to the airport, you fly to Perth, which was like four hours. Beep, beep, beep. You went through the airport to a different, like, the Rex gate or you know, yeah, the dreaded small say, aircraft gate. The <laughs> and then you go to Geraldton, which is another hour on, on the plane. And then we'd stay overnight because that would be an entire day's travel. Mm -hmm. And then we'd get up very early in the morning, like stupid o'clock. We'd rent a mine-ready four-wheel drive, so something with all the safety gear, all the features, all the like super over-equipped with everything. <laughs> we'd have to go to Woolies or Coles and get like yeah. huge mm -hmm. uh, five-litre bottles of um, water, water and all the yeah. food and safety stuff and EPIRB, like satellite phones. Um, mm -hmm. We'd have to do a massive check of all the equipment. Mm. check the tires the oil the water everything petrol and then um all the spares mm -hmm. and then do this checklist and then drive for four and a half hours through mm -hmm. the outback mostly dirt roads um and, and then not very good dirt roads and, and they were all right in the end because we <laughs> built the project there so it kind of like improved the roads but yeah improved first they weren't, you... they weren't as good <laughs> and then we, we stayed overnight and then we drove another half hour 40 minutes in the morning to the observatory and then we were there so it was dead easy yeah, it's quite <laughs> <easy>. <laughs> it's just a Sometimes weekend away. Because when we had a VIP visitor, I was taking um, like you know, an important government person or a funder or someone or a journalist. We would fly um from Geraldton to the site on a private plane. Ah. But when I say fly to the site, again, it's nearly an hour's drive away, and we'd land on this kind of dirt strip, which had a horse <laughs> in, invariably at the end of it, and they would just stand there staring at us like, "What are you doing?" Oh. What are you doing? <laughs> on this oh. It was it was very very cool. I yeah. love it. Oh, and so the site is there so that you have very little um, interference. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a it's a beautiful place, and people have lived there and, and looked after the the land for tens of thousands of years. So it's, it's not that nobody's there, but it's uh, that there aren't any towns or cities, and uh, there there isn't a lot of like radio noise um, anywhere near a town city. Um, anywhere with infrastructure uh, of a, a sort of you know modern type is um just a wash with pollution basically not invisible pollution in the <laughs> air to do with radio waves um every communication device that we have mobile phones they don't work out there because there isn't that infrastructure so it's a terrific place um you have to turn your phone off when you get near the site it wouldn't work anyway so it might as well be off um, well and there's no transmitters allowed um so it's a yeah it's a really um it's it's quite a good um career actually for loners the uh, radio astronomy <laughs> just turn yeah, your phone yeah. off right yeah. i'm at the observatory <laughs> by yeah. throw it in a bin and off you go it's absolutely a site that our radio team would love they complain constantly yes, yeah. about the fact that we, we so our dark sky site doesn't have a lot there's you don't have great phone signal up there if at all um but we do have um i call it skynet we have star starlink um and you know, they're okay with that because we need to have some yeah. connection to it but then everyone gets up here with their mobile phones and hooks up onto the wi-fi and mm -hmm. they know they know when we have a public star party as opposed to when it's just general members act, uh, accessing the site because they can see so much more noise yeah. just appear on their on, on their equipment it's like oh yeah we're definitely having a star party right now there's definitely 300 people on site all with their phones trying to take photos and there was this very famous discovery at the parks telescope yes um, <laughs> not too long ago um it was embarrassing for those involved but it wasn't their fault but no. yeah, it was something really exciting signal was found and it, it ended up being the microwave oven. microwave <laughs> yeah every time the microwave door opened or something or dinged was it or something like yeah, that you weren't yeah. allowed to use it for certain hours yeah. and they had like cages and stuff but there was this one microwave that didn't have that cage and someone's someone just doing their lunch, you know. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> that didn't happen again. <laughs> no, it wouldn't have. I'm sure the microwave hasn't survived either. No, I don't think so. I think that one was unplugged and chucked in the river. <laughs> No, you can't use that one anymore. Yeah. So you've had a bit of a crew change um, being the Australian Women in STEM ambassador, although I know yeah. from when you were 
as an astrophysicist more full time that uh, this was something very dear to your heart. Anyway, um, so can you tell us what that's like and um, where you see STEM looking for women uh, who are in the field or entering the field? What are your thoughts? Yeah. I've been preparing all day or for this part. To enter the field. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, there's so many. So, yeah, there's so much need for yeah. um, people with STEM skills, and it's not necessarily that we need a bunch of scientists because scientists know that there aren't many jobs for scientists, right? Yeah. So it's not about just science <laughs> yeah. jobs. It's about um, STEM skills. So mm -hmm. you know, for example, if you want to, um, you know, work in any field, mm -hmm. let's say you want to be an artist or an illustrator. Mm -hmm. You, you're going to use technology. You're, you're almost never going to draw on a piece yeah. of paper. You're going to use technology. You're going to use a lot of tech in uh, being an Uber driver. You're going to use a lot of tech. Um, if you work in health uh, or medicine, you're going to use, you know, every single career. You get you get the picture, right? Every, everything we do now is going to in, interact with AI and different technologies, digital tech. Um, so people are going to need these skills whether or not they think they're going into science. Um, but, you know, there are just so many skills shortages around the world. And one of the big problems is that women's participation in STEM, science, technology, engineering, maths, is very low compared to men's. And that's, you know, due to sort of historical disparities that women were actively not just discouraged but banned Chance, from yeah. working in science and technology until very recently in certain um, precursors to science and technology so you know my my mum uh, when she was at school she uh, wasn't allowed at a girls school to learn science mm -hmm. um, you know the, the next generation uh, I when I went to a high school's open day to see if I wanted to go to that school um, they said oh the girls don't do woodwork and metalwork they do this and the, they don't do this mm -hmm. the boys do this and I was just like what year is it oh. you know it's the <laughs> 1990s. <laughs> and even today, you know, there's a lot of disparities in education, a lot of um, problems with the lack of role models or assumptions or people driving kids to different aspirations. Um, but also there's a lot of problems in workplaces where um, a lot of unfairness, gender pay gaps, all that kind of stuff, bullying, harassment. So there's serious problems around workplaces still. And my role as Australia's Women in STEM ambassador is to try to identify those to carry out re research to deeply understand the drivers of inequity. It's not just gender based, it's, it can be a number of different factors. Um, and to try and break those down because it's just bad for everyone. If you have a workplace that's rubbish and has a lot of people not behaving professionally, or if you have a workplace whose policies don't serve people who have other needs in their life or other responsibilities, it doesn't serve anyone. It doesn't serve men, certainly. So it's about really understanding those barriers um, and, and trying to break them down. So I've got a research team who works in my office and um, we, we work really hard with other agencies to try and figure this stuff out. Yeah, it's one of those things where I see, so I, I work in a few different places around Melbourne, but I spend a lot of time actually with um, school groups um, of all ages, really, from like um, what we call prep here in Victoria, but I think of as kindergarten still, even though I've been here for a very long time. We have kindergarten uh, as well. We have kindergarten. Different. Prep. Kindergarten is preschool. So I see preschoolers as well, but not as much. <laughs> um, and all the way up to adults at university. And um, even like my year five students, you can see the girls are just less um willing to answer questions or to get involved mm -hmm. in um, sort of activities um and the teachers i've been noticing are actually doing much better at encouraging like hey girls you know you know i know that you know the answer come on tell her um uh but yeah it's um and i noticed even today i had a, a class on mars with year five students and the the girls were looking at a question and just asking for help immediately and their teacher was like you know come on you give it a go first um and yeah it's just this like you know this is this is not where I belong um it's mm. really really early <laughs> that it starts yeah, it's, it's, yeah. yeah. there's it's differences it's, in socialization as well yeah. and sort of communication yeah um willingness to make mistakes i think that yeah. um yes. comes in from very young age of you know yeah. you look at how young kids are socialized and some kids are encouraged to take more risks than others and yeah, yeah there's a lot of complex factors involved yeah. definitely yeah i just want right. to 
talk to the girls and say, do you think any of these boys care about if, like, they yell out an answer and they're right or wrong? Like, no, they don't. <laughs> literally That's, in this class, I'm already told them, like, yeah, nice but, idea. Yeah. Um, and I sort of, this one of the part of me that hopes that, like, seeing a woman being at the front there and being like, you know, you guys are my scientists today, you know, um, might give them something to sort of look at and be like, oh, okay, yeah, I can, she's a scientist, I can be a scientist too, but uh, well, keep Steffi, trying. You know, <laughs> keep chipping you away. Know, <laughs> you know that Sadie, no, loves, you know that Sadie know. loves your um, bright, colourful outfits and she loves <laughs> that you're a scientist. I, my, I've got a 10-year-old daughter and um, I think part of it comes down to also not just parenting but the family environment outside of just the parents as well, like siblings and grandparents and and extended family. Um, Sadie's been lucky enough to be exposed to her older brother who is passionate about astronomy but but also loves her to bits and will feed her information. Um, She's been exposed to the ACV since she was 18 months old. She... As a ten-year-old now, can control the big telescopes up at the dark sky site, and the guys up there have no issues with her doing it because they know she knows what she's doing. Um, yeah. So she gets she's lucky enough in that she gets exposed to all of that, and nobody tells her no. Everybody says, "Here, that's, have a turn." Yeah, that's really cool. That's so important, isn't it? Yeah. It's teaching kids. Um, it's not just confidence. It's um, <clears throat> it's that understanding, self-efficacy, like yeah. the belief that you can do things, you can try things, and that you yeah, have yeah. the ability to learn and improve. And it's that yeah. growth mindset. It's, but you know, talked about a lot. But it, it growth mindset that you can actually um, change your abilities. Yeah. They're not fixed as well um that's so important to instill in all young people i did a research just a very short research essay on some barriers to women's participation in undergraduate physics because that's what i mostly teach (laughs) um and seeing that even in like first semester women go from like their self-efficacy they rate it like themselves as a physicist and then from like first to second semester it just drops off immediately and I'm like oh no I teach first semester <laughs> like what you know did I um, break them <laughs> yeah. yeah and then I'm like I teach first semester astronomy I don't teach first semester physics but um um yeah I like after doing this little essay um like almost every class now I get the students to tell me like I felt like a scientist today or I felt like an engineer today to get them sort of yeah. used to thinking of themselves as you know a a 10 year old scientist but like someone who does science or science activities and things like that and again I you know I have I'm not allowed to to do research because I have not done any sort of ethics (laughs) stuff but like (laughs) I would love to be able to follow these kids and and see like you know where they go where they they go um Mm. Um, I'll just collaborate with a social scientist yeah. and then get them to do the ethics approval. Yeah, that would be ideal. It's but really complicated. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's what I do. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask, like, what sort of research do you and your team do? Um, yeah. Well, we've done it. We've done a few bits now, and I'm not leading any of this. Is my my team yeah. definitely leading the way? But I've come yeah. up with some of the ideas, and then yeah. kind of hired people to do the the real the real work. But um, yeah, yeah we've just published. Um, we're just publishing one, which is a 20 year study of mm-hmm. all the outcomes of grant applications from scientists yeah, in Australia. Yeah. So scientists, you know, have to apply for grant funding so they can do their science. They don't magically get the money from the money tree uh, and universities don't pay it. It's it's from mm. things like the Australian <laughs> Research Council. So they have an idea. They apply for the funding, mostly don't get it, but a few small uh, pots of money are actually billions of dollars, but it's um, a lot less than is applied for. So what we did, um, the team looked at uh, 20 for the last 20 years um, by gender, what men and women applied for and what they were awarded to, to see if there were any gender differences and looked at different types of universities, whether it depended on the field of research, like whether it's chemistry or physics or bi- biology or astronomy and um it turns out, and, and whether there's differences, whether you're a professor or a junior um, researcher. So the paper's just come out, and um, if I can sort of summarise it very quickly. Yeah, go so for the, it. the grant um, application, grant applications by men and women are actually judged very similarly, and there's no real differences in outcomes. It's just that there's so few women in many of the fields that they're receiving a lot less grant mm. funding 
but there's no evidence of bias in the process itself. So if a woman applies for a grant, she's um, just as likely to actually receive it, which is not very likely, sadly. <laughs> um, but actually Sorry. we're looking at where the bias comes in. It isn't in the, the application process itself. It actually comes before that during yeah. university tenure. And a lot of women are dropping out of universities in their 30s, which also coincides with the time they often have a career break. Um, so it's really the structures and systems in universities we need to look at to actually make sure that everyone can succeed in their careers, whether or not they have to have career breaks for family or other reasons. So it's really important to like look at those research findings and not just make assumptions about where the problems are lying. So I guess in one part, it's, it's good that there's no bias, but it's bad that it's clear that there's just not enough women in those fields to be making the number of applications for grants funding that there are men making the number of applications. Yeah, that's it. And look, yeah. there are but there are biases in some processes um, and there's a couple of grant schemes where they have found um, problems because they kind of, they try and fiddle around with them and the rules and it, it doesn't work very well unless you carefully you know, monitor and control what you're doing. So it's, it's all a bit of a scientific experiment in itself. Um, but yeah, we're just trying to make a, a better system for everyone so that you're not forcing organizations to say well, you have to have a certain number of this type of person or that type of person but actually how do we break the barriers that exist yeah. so that everyone can succeed in a and have room to breathe and and do what they need to do in their life as well as work I remember when I went to my astronomical society when I was a kid and um, there weren't any women who weren't married to a, one of the men who were on the committee you know there, mm -hmm. there, there really weren't any sort of independent um, yeah. women members um, who came from their own perspective of interest mm -hmm. and uh, yeah I was I was a 12 year old girl <laughs> rocking up with these 70 year old men it was quite yeah. it was quite interesting but you know yeah. I, I made some good friends there they were nice people. I mean, if you look back at the Carte de Seal program and what they were using as what were termed computers was uh, mm -hmm. young females who knew how to do maths and calculations and check um Fast plates for for image movement, you know. That, yeah. And then the moment they were married or or similar, they were just you can't be one of the you can't can't be involved in this program anymore. And like it's, yeah, it's slowly changing. Ruby Payne Scott. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the like early a, astronomer. Yeah, They're just getting there slowly. Getting there slowly. Yeah. Let's ask about the Future You campaign that your office runs. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. So um, as I think we've we've talked about, you know, that young people need to understand that STEM is really important for them, science and technology, engineering and maths, and it, it's, it's used in so many future careers. And um, we want to break down barriers and stereotypes about STEM careers and who does them and what the pathways are. So if you look at programs like the Big Bang Theory, which is kind of like it's a comedy but it also sort of amplifies the stereotypes around what type of people do science and that's you know kind of slightly odd generally male <laughs> um loners uh you know with with sort of social awkward manners uh, and it's just it's just quite damaging to society as a whole when people think that that's all that scientists are they're lone geniuses who who don't work in teams they don't collaborate um and it's a stereotype that actually puts people off, um, although I actually enjoy watching the show. Um, it's, it's not great for, for all of us. Um, so basically Future You is a program funded by the Australian government that we run at the Office of the Women in STEM Ambassador. And um, it shows millions of kids across Australia that STEM careers are for everyone. And there are really interesting STEM pathways um, that can take you into solving problems that matter to young people like, um, you know, climate change and, you know, renewable energy, um, really interesting new topics like food safety, edible bugs, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, battery technologies, wind power um, and, and things like um, keeping the Internet safe for everyone, yeah. uh, disability um, accessibility on Google, um, again, technology, science, innovation, it's just uh, showing really cool career role models for young people and trying to help them understand how they can get into STEM um, outside of just what they learn at school. So I think it's sort of part and parcel of, you know, what the Astronomical Society of Victoria does yeah. and what um, other organisations do to try to get young people to see possibilities 
in science and technology. Um, but we have a lot of teachers' resources and things on our yeah. website, futureaustralia.com.au. And people Absolutely. can go on there. It's all free. It's just what was that one again? What is it? It's futureaustralia.com.au. And uh, yeah, it's terrific. It right There's like a careers quiz. There are lots and lots of um, activities to do, videos to watch, um, and people can understand if they want to be a particular type of, um, go to a particular type of STEM career, what they can do, whether they go through vocational training, university, or other pathways as well. So you can see that STEM is not just all people in their ivory towers in universities, but it's lots of different pathways like trades uh, and apprenticeships as well. I love it. I'm having a look now. This is cool. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're very proud of it. We've just um, about it. yeah, we've got we've got um, books as well. We've we've got um, young fiction authors to write different books set in space. It's called Imagining the Future as part of the <laughs> the program, and we printed out um, many hundreds of the books and partnered with Deadly Science, an organisation, mm -hmm. a charity that sends those books to um, First Nations communities in regional and remote areas of Australia. So we're working really with different communities across the country to try and bring this to them. Um, as I say, it's all free because it's funded by the government and um, available for everyone. I'm going to go and scour that website tonight and have a look <laughs> see what I can learn from it. Yeah, terrific. Thank you. It's still developing, but it's got it's got some great resources already. Mm -hmm. And we're putting new role models on there all the time. So everyone's got yeah. someone who's like them uh, and they can see someone like them on the website. So we're going to get more men on there as well uh, and lots of role models for everyone. I say Wonderful. someone who teaches, as I mentioned, all sorts of ages, um, mm -hmm. but especially primary school kids, um, is a really great resource. On to the next question, though. Um, you're an author. I am. Uh, you are oh, an yeah. author. And the book you were talking about earlier, the one, uh, what was it? The, the... When Galaxies Collide. Yes. My son has a copy of that. I'll say had a copy of it, which you had signed, but then he took it camping for school and they got flooded. Oh, <laughs> it's pretty so rugged. Yeah, but he's still got it. He's still got it. Oh, well. He's got a new version as well. So it was very, it was very <laughs> um, how, how did you get into writing books about astronomy? Like how did that happen? Yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. I didn't expect this. Um, I used to read a lot of books on astronomy, as I said earlier. And I just always, you know, something you think there's a dream and out of possible realm of possibility. Um, obviously, I'd done 15 years of my career in astrophysics and I started to do a lot more outreach and, um, you know, public talks and things. And then I got a few call ups to be on the television and present astronomy on Stargazing Live on the ABC and things like that. And when that happens, suddenly, um, apparently, um, book publishers write to you. <laughs> and say, would you like to write a book? So I was actually just minding my own business, doing my job, and um, somebody from Melbourne University Publishing uh, wrote to me and said, would you like to write a book about astronomy? And I was like, wow, yeah, I really would. I was thinking, well, how am I going to do this with my time? Um, but it turned out I'd just been at CSIRO almost 10 years, and I just got my long service leave. So I managed to take three months off full time. Oh, nice and write this book and uh yeah it was amazing it was it was hard at first um because i'd never written anything i'd written loads of papers dozens of papers and research reports and worky stuff but that stuff like no one else can read because it's all in jargon and and you know it, it's not it's not in obvious what it means <laughs> to anyone else <laughs> who hasn't been trained in that exact that exact field yes. so um yeah it, it it was a little bit of an adjustment to write in normal english again uh, but a joy to actually share those stories and um turned out that book went okay and i wanted to write a children's book after that so i wrote that and that went really well and it kept going and going and i've now i've written six books in fact mm. i've written 10 but the other four <laughs> haven't been published yet <laughs> so, so we've got four I'm more books to come. Yeah. yeah 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 definitely oh, oh actually more because i've got a contract for two more 
the uh, Thames oh, Council. So, awesome. Yes, yes, there's a lot more to come. There's a lot more to That's come. That's good. Um, yeah, we have a new book out now called The Universal Guide to the Night Sky. What sort of journey does yeah. this book take us on? Oh, God, I love it. I expect to learn I'm a bit nerd. I'm a bit nerd. There it is. Um, and it, look, it's a beautiful book for kids. Um, mm-hmm. It's illustrated by Sophie Bear, who is a very talented um, mm-hmm. writer oh. and illustrator of children's books. You'll see her stuff in the in the bookshops. Mm-hmm. They're, they're wonderful. So we've got her to illustrate it. And um, it's called The Universal Guide to the Night Sky because mm-hmm. it's universal. It's, it's, for, it's, it's a pun on the word universe, but it's also... Um, universal in the sense that it can be used in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. Mm-hmm. Do you know what? A bugbear of mine. I go into book look on the bookshelves, and the books on astronomy. A lot of them will have the northern hemisphere constellations only. Yes, yeah. yeah. American, British book, and I'm like, what is the what's the use of this here? Yeah, yeah. It's a guide to the night sky in the north. So I wanted to write on because these books are published all over the world. That was relevant to everyone. It wasn't just about the Southern Cross and uh, you know, it, or just the Polaris and the Great Bear and all this. It was actually for everyone, and it was relevant to sort of modern day stargazing. Um, not just what you can see, and here's a hunter, and here's a dolphin, and whatever, as ancient stories. But it was relevant to anyone who wants to know the latest apps, the latest websites, mm-hmm. activities. It's really for young people, but it can be for anyone. Uh, and that was the that was kind of rationale. And we've set it up like um, with fun facts and activities, and um, really astounding kind of breakout boxes about things, little bits of extra information for those who are super keen. Um, But otherwise we go through the, you know, the constellations, the planets, things like asteroids and um, galaxies, deep sky objects, anything you can see with the naked eye, Um, meteor showers. um, And then I talk about all the tech and all the the modern stuff that you can do. So really stargazing in a nutshell um, for everyone on planet Earth. See, tech's where it's at. I love the tech side. I (laughs) I was saying earlier, earlier, learning to use those Melbourne Observatory telescopes, they're like 100 years old. And when we were learning, they're like, oh, you have to learn how to calculate sidereal time in hour <laughs> angle. And I'm like, but I've got Stellarium. <laughs> Press the button. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stellarium. And, it's and good it's to great. know what it is, but you don't yeah, need to it, use it. Exactly. It's great to know what it is, but you don't need to know how to do it. So I can choose an object in the sky. And I can go to Stellarium, I can go, what's the hour angle and the declination mm-hmm. for this object right now? And I can put, I can move the, this 100-year-old telescope into the right position. Bang, there it is. Very easy. So it's using okay. old technology with, with new technology. And I'm very big on new tech. I mean, I, I take photos of the night sky using a mobile phone as my astro camera. That's, that's yeah. what I do. Um, just to show people look what you can do with very simple things that we all own yeah and look i talk about that a little bit so it's always hard people you know have phones and they think well i took a picture of the moon and it just looked like a blob so yeah. i can't do it so i'm like no no you know use this setting use this, yeah. use this app, yeah, yeah. You know, nice guy apps um that you yeah. can download yeah. Yeah. exposure photography just buy one of these really cheap little tripods mm-hmm. and just pop it you know I, I actually take my camera out on a walk sometimes and i pop it on a like a random rock or something in the <laughs> neighborhood like a fence or something yeah. and you know i take selfies with the stars behind there you go there's your little <laughs> tripod it's my 20 dollar talk- tripod from kmart oh, that's brilliant <laughs> yeah. that's brilliant and I, I you know i talk about things um you know we we used to use binoculars i never actually owned a telescope um mm-hmm. i have always either not had any money when i was younger or just moved around too much to actually buy one <laughs> from it so and i have the full work so yeah um but you know i've never owned um a telescope it's not that they're not great they are mm-hmm. i'd love to own one but um yeah. and one day i will when i feel settled enough <laughs> but binoculars can be great and they give you that wider field of view so as well you get more you get more sort of bang for your buck i was just staring out the window last night actually yeah. just randomly and saw the international mm-hmm. space station I was oh just like, nice i haven't seen like it cool. it went just tell Friday people how to use well, that yeah. magic you know in, in the night sky and i think it's a lovely activity for um i i, I talk to the children in the book of course the young people and say mm-hmm. This is something you can teach your parents, blah, blah, blah. And, you <laughs> <Yeah>. know, <laughs> I think it's a, it's a genuine opportunity to family for families to come together yeah. and 
you know, parents and kids to actually teach each other stuff and learn together as well. So I think that's, you know, one of the beautiful things about Universal Guide that it's something everyone can read together as well. What I like about this, what I like about this one is the fact that you're talking about the southern skies as well as the northern yeah. skies. Like you're talking about books just mainly being about the northern skies. Oh, a lot them. of my a lot mm. of my friends, my astronomy buddies I've met through um astronomy groups on Facebook and that are all from the Northern Hemisphere and they're very jealous of what we have to go yeah. and see down mm -hmm. in the southern skies. They yeah, get very jealous when I put up a picture of, no, they get very grumpy. They're like, oh, eat a Karina. I can't see Karina Nebula. That's not fair. Like, oh, well, yeah. that's what I've got. You don't know. Uh -huh. oh, and uh, look, I, I want to do a pop quiz with you because we've got yeah. two constellations oh, yeah, on the front there. What have you got? Right, a little we've bit of a quiz. Press. We've got Cassiopeia. Yeah. Oh, there. Quiz, yeah. Yeah, and the uh, Cassiopeia there. So yeah. my favourite yeah, one in the northern skies and then yeah. obviously southern everyone cross. likes the Southern Cross. So. <laughs> there you go. Bit of and both. We have, we have southern Cross, the False Cross, the Diamond Cross. I love I love uh, Scorpio, actually. That's probably my favourite. Yeah, so I've been... It's just, that shape is amazing and then the, you know... Um, it's so busy. Big orange star at the end of the tail. Akinar. It's just like, yeah, it was bang. Akinar, Akinar in its yeah. head. And in its body. It. Antares, sorry, Antares. Oh, yeah. 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 I love yeah, it. I've, I've spent a lot of time on that through winter, imaging that area, so Griffith Nebula yeah. and Lagoon Nebula and that. So I guess the big question is where do we get your book from? And we're, we're going to put all the details in the, in the description. What, of the... If you want to, you know, pray at the altar of American billionaires, you'd go on Amazon, but don't do that. Don't do that. Go to your local <laughs> bookshop, support your like, local yeah. bookshop, yeah. or... If you want to go, if you want to get like a really nice personalized copy, like, you know, you could go camping and get it drenched in water, <laughs> yeah. especially from me. Yeah. And I'll write you a wonderful personal message. You can go on my website, lisaharveysmith.com, uh, and go. you can buy them there. So it's it's completely up to you. Just don't go on the Evil Billionaires site if you can avoid it. <laughs> All right, there we go. We know where to buy it from. And just don't take it camping. Yeah. <laughs> or to, don't throw it in a river. Like, don't just, throw it in a river. Yeah. Don't. I'll, just don't. I bet you that's what he did. There was no flood. I bet you he just dropped it. In <laughs> second last question. When you're not this busy being an astrophysicist. Question. No, it's the second last because we've got the fun bit afterwards. Um, oh, when you're not busy question. being an astrophysicist. Well, all right. No, because there is. All right. It's the last. Stop problem. bickering. I know we like an old married couple, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> um, Blimey. When do you not busy <laughs> being an astrophysicist and a radio astronomer and an author? Um, what do you do? What's you, what, what what sort of arms oh, you like do? decompress? Yeah, you know, yeah. Where's your okay? I'm going to switch off now. Are I you love, one of those people I'm, like me that just doesn't switch off? No, no, no. I, I don't switch off much, but I do. I try and get out on a walk every day at least. Yeah. Um, I love running. I love hiking. Um, absolutely love just discovered paddle boarding oh my god such oh. fun stand up paddle boarding is so lovely and once it's at first it's terrifying and awful yeah. and then it, you learn how to do it and then you're like ah oh. it's really <laughs> relaxing you look you look like one of those serene people gliding oh. along so that's very nice um as i said earlier i also like orienteering which is like mm -hmm. puzzles maps and <laughs> running all at once which i absolutely love so anything getting out into nature mm -hmm. anything mm -hmm. you know connecting with with nature and and I love cooking too. Cooking up a storm. Mm. Very different things. Fellow hiker here, so yeah, oh, good times. <laughs> I, I've done I've done Oxfam. Um, I do oh, like. Yeah, the, I've done Oxfam. Yeah. Oh, that's a challenge, isn't it? Oh, Steffi, you feel this left out. The, the hundred kilometer one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I volunteered Oxfam as a <laughs> trail guide. There you go. We've um, all done. We've all I done. Didn't, I didn't have to do the walking, but I handed out. Water, I think oh, there's something there. very peaceful about walking. I love walking through the bush. Just it's good fun. Yeah. It, that oh. calming thing again. I ran it. It wasn't very calm. <laughs> no, no, no. I look kudos to the people who did run it. To, to oh. people like you who ran Oxfam, man, that's – I couldn't do that. It. No, that's... I wouldn't recommend it. I saw how quick some of the people running it did it, and I'm just like, wow, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was hard walking it. I, we walked, I walked at a fairly good pace too, and that was tough. Like, I couldn't imagine running it. That's just crazy. I guess it's time for our um, spot quiz. Yeah. And the spot quiz is where we ask questions of our guests oh um, God. based on a topic <laughs> that is taken from the first letter of their first name. And Ooh. being an L, 
We've gone. That's with hell. The, oh, I thought that was one of the questions. No. <laughs> Steffi recommends we go with we go with lizards. Um, <laughs> lizards. All right. I know nothing about those. This will be good. Well, that's the idea. The idea is to show everybody that um, that you're just a normal person. That's like such a good idea. I love that. That's disarming. I like it. So I may know about astronomy, but I don't know anything about lizards. Yeah. So the first question is, what lizards are only found, or what, what lizard, what type of lizard is only found in Australia? Is it the bunga or the mo monitor lizard? No. no. They mm -hmm. are. found in Indonesia as well. Oh. Yeah. Of course, yeah. <laughs> are they flat Go on there. Flat, Go on. Take me out of misery. Lizard, uh, also Which called leg legless lizards or snake legless. lizards, are found only in Australia and New Guinea. Um, oh, wow. They're mistaken for snakes, and have uh, but remnants of hind legs can still be seen as small flaps. They have an external ear openings, and their tongues are not forked. Although none of those characteristics can readily be seen in some species, so they are the only ones that are indigenous only to Australia and New Guinea. You can't get them anywhere else in the world. We don't have yes. any any lizards in the UK. So when I yeah. come here, <laughs> no, there are lizards in the everywhere. UK. There are oh, definitely we don't see them. The the, you won't yeah, see them, no. See yeah. them, though. Unless you're in a woodland, which I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> <laughs> what if you're hiking in the woodland? Um, Dog poo. <laughs> <It's just laughs> not I'm obviously not a hiker. So my question is, what is the most abundant type of lizard in Australia? Got to be skink. Yeah. It is indeed the skink. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Randomly, Australia there's has lots in the garden. <laughs> Australia has more skinks than any other country, and there are more skink species in Australia than any other kind of lizard. I did a bit of research on this, and there are 1,600 different types of skink in the world, <laughs> and nearly a 1,000 of them are in Australia. Uh, <laughs> there's six in my shed right now. There's a family of them. We leave water out for them in little shelters. Uh, like a little little house what is the largest lizard in the world oh now this is the one that's in madagascar i believe I no not madagascar not? no but you haven't got it wrong yet because you haven't told no. us the name so that's like a free <laughs> <That's crazy. laughs> uh, is that one that can kill you with its tail what's that called <gasps> i'm just gonna i just can't remember the name so i'm just gonna go monitor again yeah <laughs> It is a type of monitor lizard. Yeah, we'll go with that. A Komodo dragon. That's the one I was thinking yeah. of. Where where's the place then if it's not Madagascar? I Indonesia. Know, I, Indonesia. It <laughs> I didn't read down slightly before I before I <laughs> sort of the, biggest, the biggest Komodo <laughs> dragon they found is 10.3 feet long, so 3.1 meters long, and they average 70 kilos. And I didn't put this in, but the smallest lizard averages 12 grams oh this is fun i like lizard learning <laughs> i learn a lot when i was researching this this is good yeah nice. second last question name the only lizard that has vocal cords gary <laughs> oh the actual type of lizard, <laughs> type of lizard. Oh, um, give it a name <laughs> i'll give you a hint i'll give you a hint you were right with the start of the first letter of the name <laughs> oh no Oh, really? Oh, well, I've well, I've heard of it. Is it famous or not really? Type of lizard? Yeah. Everyone's heard of this type of lizard. Yeah, you will. Yeah. I don't know. I'm going to go. Uh, uh. The gecko is the only species. Of <gasps> the gecko. I know that. I've been on holiday. <laughs> they talk to you on the walls. Yeah. Yeah. In Indonesia. <laughs> Yeah. Or Thailand. <laughs> Thailand, Thailand. Last question. What separates lizards from snakes? Is this like when you, on QI, you say an obvious answer <laughs> and then it goes... Rrr, rrr, rrr. That's, I this... think it's probably pretty obvious. Is it legs? No, 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 because you've got legs. No. Lizards, so, no, oh, okay, legs. all right. Is, yeah. is it, the, is it the, the ones lays eggs? Or do they all lay eggs? No, you can get lizards that lay eggs. We haven't Ooh. said no yet, so we'll give you a bit longer. Do lizards have a, like bones? They have a spine and snakes don't? Skeleton, is it that? No, snakes have bones. Snakes have, they? yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. They got bones. I thought they, they were spines. just like, God, I don't know anything about snakes, do I? All right. This is all terrible. Right. No, tell me, tell me. All right. 
It's not the fact that one has legs and the other doesn't because some lizards are similar in that regard. Instead, a lizard has external ears and eyelids while uh, snakes don't have them. Snakes don't have eyelids and ears. Snakes uh, can't hear. They sense they through vibration. Believe. They can't. Well, they have the thingies, that little webby stuff, but they don't oh. have actual eyelids. Um, and oh, they don't wow. hear. They listen through um, vibration. So, and they smell through their sense through their tongue. Oh, God, this yeah. is brilliant. They lick their oh, eyes right. to, uh, we need to moist. <laughs> yeah. oh. They need like windscreen wipers or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I nice. just imagine it. Oh, uh, well, they get so, one out of five. I don't feel so bad. Yeah, I'm, I'm pleased with that. I'm pleased with that. I think right. I'm just as bad. I got zero out she of five when Steffi questioned me. I, I feel two. like oh, I didn't two. deserve that one, but I don't know. No, nah, no, you can have that one. That's all right. You get two out of five. So you got that's two a, points. That's a pass rate then, isn't it? Just. Better than I, look, I got as well. I only got one out of five. So. Yeah, I got a zero out of five. Um, Fred Watson got. <laughs> Fred Watson was giving himself points. He was, just, he was making good, his yeah. own questions and giving himself points. So. <laughs> oh, Fred. I think I think Sarah's winning, though. Sarah's was, was Sarah, Sarah winning. Sarah Yeah. 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 yeah, we picked the wrong topic. We picked sea slugs, wasn't it, or something sea like cucumbers. that? Sea cucumbers. And she's like, oh, I know everything about them. We're like, who knows about sea cucumbers? Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah. Well, well, there you go. Look, Lisa, it's been wonderful having you. Thank you very much for joining us. It's um, been awesome. Thank you. Uh, we try and make these as lighthearted, as fun as we can. It's the whole idea of the podcast that we do. It's just fun catching up with people and getting to know um, the, the astronomers and astrophysicists that everyone looks up to a little bit more on um, on a more casual level. So thank Good you, for, thank you for joining us. And, um, All the best, Legends. Yeah. Thanks for listening and supporting us as we continue to learn on our podcast journey. If you'd like to contribute to the podcast, you can head to www.patreon.com forward slash spaghettification podcast and support us for as little as one can of beer a day.